Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to talk about distributive shock, which includes things like septic shock, anaphylactic shock, and technically neuro neurogenic shock, but neurogenic will get its own separate video. We're going to discuss the actual physiologic problem, causes, expected changes, and a variety of parameters that you can see here on the left, and what we can do about it. My goal, as always in these shock videos, is to ensure that you, the viewer, understands the base concept of the problem, and then understand what the body tries to do to compensate. These parameters uh, that we'll hear on the left, hopefully you can work through them once we're done with this video, as opposed to having to feel like you have to memorize them. So I've drawn the diagram I'm going to draw for all my shock videos. We have the heart, we have the arterial system, which gets blood to the tissues. We have the venous system, which returns blood to the heart from the tissue. And then we have the nervous system, which innervates these systems. The problem in this case is here at the arterial system, supplying your tissues. As a result of sepsis or anaphylaxis, the body releases a number of inflammatory mediators which lead to major vasodilation and increased permeability. This is going to be the problem in distributive shock around which all of the rest of the physiology and comp compensatory physiology will follow primarily a decrease in our systemic vascular resistance. Decrease systemic vascular resistance. So honestly, this one is pretty easy. Everything except for our cardiac output and heart rate decrease. So our ejection fraction goes down, our wedge pressures go down, everything goes down, but our heart rate goes up, and that's to compensate for our decreased ejection fraction. And our cardiac output, our blood, our heart rate actually increases enough to compensate for it, at least for a little bit. As we've mentioned before, resistance is equal to rho, which is the symbol for resistivity, which is a constant over the length, length over the area. And again, our vessels normally vasoconstrict in order to increase our blood pressure. But here, the problem is the area increases, which leads to an overall decrease in resistance. And this is a result in distributive shock that the blood vessels dilate uncontrollably, so the area goes up massively as a result of the inflammatory mediators, leading to a huge decrease in systemic vascular resistance. And this leads to a drop in our blood pressure because force equals, I apologize, pressure equals force over area. And as our area plummets, our pressure I apologize, as our area goes way up because we're vasodilating, our pressure plummets. Sorry, it looks like I'm in power saver mode. I'm gonna have to finish this one quickly. So our central venous pressure drops as a result of less fluid in the system, like I've marked here. And if our central venous pressure drops, that means that less blood is coming back to the right side of the heart and thus to the left side of the heart and less blood volume is in the left side of the heart, means less pressure in the left atrium. So our capillary wedge pressure drops and our central venous pressure drops. Our ejection fraction drops. On one hand, there's less blood filling the left side of the heart, leading to less stretch or starling curve uh, effect, and therefore less ejection fraction. And there's simply less overall blood to eject. Finally, the two things that increase in distributive shock are our heart rate, which would be the expectation because cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. And our stroke volume has gone down as a result of decreased preload, so our heart rate goes up to compensate in order to keep our cardiac output constant. And our cardiac output either goes up or stays about the same as the heart rate goes up to compensate for this decreased stroke volume. So we need to briefly take a look at the signs and symptoms that will differentiate this kind of shock from other kinds of shock. So we'll say signs and symptoms. And these patients are actually going to be warm and sometimes flushed. And this is because the blood vessels supplying the skin also massively dilate, leading to flushing and warming. They also may appear septic if they are in fact sick uh, or infected or with signs of acute infection, or they may appear anaphylactic, so swollen uh, and with a closed airway, rash, etc., itching. And so understanding this is very important, and it really helps differentiate from other kinds of shock. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, septic 
and anaphylactic are two major examples of this type of shock. And we really have to manage this treatment-wise with uh, blood pressure support, usually fluids, uh, as hopefully you all know from the saving, uh, uh, stopping sepsis campaign, as well as the use of pressors as needed in order to keep their blood pressure up until you can treat the underlying problem, be it the infection or the anaphylactic issue or later on the neurogenic issue that we'll talk about in another video. So again, signs and symptoms, flush skin, obvious sepsis, plummeting blood pressure, and you're really gonna to wanna to give them fluids and treat their blood pressure with pressors as needed. That's all for distributive shock. I hope this was clear and simple. As always, if you have any questions or concerns or are interested in getting involved, please feel free to contact us, subscribe below, follow us on Instagram for daily content, and stay tuned for the next video.